Hello everyone and welcome to yet another episode of the Sugar Diaries. Uh, my name is Nupur and today we have with us uh, Dr. Ganesh Jivalikar. Uh, welcome doctor. Uh, Dr. Jivalikar is one of the top uh, pediatric endocrinologists in India and uh, he's principal consultant with uh, Max Super Speci- Speciality Hospital which is in uh, Gurgaon. Over to you doctor. Yeah, hi. Uh... I mean, Nupur has introduced me. Uh, so I am basically from Maharashtra and uh, I am from Latur in Maharashtra and I've done my MBBS from Pune, BJ Medical College Pune and MD in pediatrics from uh, Mumbai, Grant Medical College Mumbai. And I've been trained at pediatric in pediatric endocrinology at Lucknow, uh, Sanjay Gandhi, a PGI Institute. I am working for the past uh, 11 years uh, in the field of pediatric endocrinology and diabetes. Um. Okay, so um, hi guys, I'm Chabi. Um, thank you, doctor, for um, doing this with us. And uh, uh-huh, I'm just going to jump into the questions. Uh, we've got a bunch of these. Um, so we actually asked uh, on our social media um, if people had any questions for you. So this is a good mix of questions that we came up with and what people have asked us. Yeah. So. Um, Let's start with the basics. Um, what made you want to like choose to be an uh, pediatric endocrinologist? Oh, uh, that's that question. The answer dates back to my uh, days in Grant Medical College, uh, and this was when I was uh, doing my residency in pediatrics, and subsequently I was a lecturer for two years in pediatrics there. And uh, although my unit was primarily a cardiac unit, uh, but uh, in those years I saw several uh, interesting, very interesting pediatric endocrine uh, conditions. So it was kind of challenging or stimulating to the brain. It involved a lot of uh, education uh, to be given to the patients and families. And the third thing is that uh, I was mainly attracted because uh, patients came in quite sick and quite, uh, I mean, for example, patients with diabetic ketoacidosis came in a very sick condition, but they became totally all right. So the outcomes were quite gratifying. So I just thought that one could make a, a significant difference. Um, and in the hindsight, it also suits my personality because I'm more of a person who kind of like takes time to analyze the case and uh, jot down the points and discuss in detail rather than having for a, something like an intensive care where decision making has to be very quick. So in, in hindsight, it was a good decision. <laughs> That's wonderful. So, Doctor, we've been, uh, I mean, of course, both of us, Chavi and I, are both type 1 diabetic. Uh, I've been type 1 for 25 years, and uh, back when I was diagnosed, you know, we simply didn't know any other diabetics. It was so um, not known, and, you know, uh, there weren't a lot of people living with type 1, or maybe they weren't open. So, do you feel like uh, type 1 is on the rise now, and type 2 as well? Yeah. So, I mean, ideally, answer to this question will be given by some epidemiological studies which have to be done to find out the population prevalence. So, unfortunately, in India, we don't have a large epidemiological studies. But if you talk of clinicians' experiences and uh, what, I mean, those who have been in the field for uh, nearly 25, 30 years, uh, one can clearly say uh, a rise in the number of uh, cases of type 1 diabetes and particularly very young children, uh, children under 5, uh, coming with this condition in the past few years. Uh, part of it could be because uh, they are being diagnosed. Some of them could be becoming very sick and probably uh, having uh, some complications before even they were diagnosed. Part of it, but I don't I don't think that that, that contributes to the whole thing. So uh, I think that clearly uh, the incidence of type 1 diabetes is on the rise. And I'm going to take a moment uh, to also, Doctor, quickly ask you about uh, the rise of type 2 diabetes in children. Do you see that yes. as well? Yes, yes. I think that is that is very clearly uh, very much there. And uh, we see increasingly type 2 diabetes happening in adolescents particularly. And uh, probably a few uh, cases of children around the age of 9 or 10 years also but mostly adolescents and the invariably it happens with a background of obesity and a family history of uh, type 2 diabetes. So since obesity is increasing, that clearly is one of the reasons why we are getting type 2 diabetes at younger uh, ages. And this is going to be a big problem in the future. 
Yeah, um, so I just wanted to talk about the fact that I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes as an adult. Um, you said that type 2 is on a rise in the adolescence. Do you think um, it's kind of overlapping now that, you know, there's no clear cut this thing that type 2 is something that you associate with just the adults and type 1 is just for the kids? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, so uh, just to clarify these things slightly better. Uh, yeah. In, in even now, in majority of the cases of children with diabetes, the diagnosis is not a very a big dilemma because mm -hmm. majority of cases of type 1 diabetes are very straightforward. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, I mean, increasingly we are facing this dilemma of differentiation between type 1 and type 2 diabetes, particularly in adolescents and young adults. Now, we have to remember that type 1 diabetes is not only a disease of children. It can happen at any age. So we have a uh, few cases of adult diabetes where the, uh, patients are not responding to multiple oral antidiabetics. And when we check for diabetes antibodies, they turn out to be actually uh, adult onset uh, type 1 diabetes. And they require insulin for diabetes control. So type 1 diabetes can happen at any age. And the age of type 2 diabetes is declining. But as of now, uh, we don't see type 1 diabetes in what we call as prepubertal children or very young children. So most of okay. the times type 2 diabetes happens in adolescents or young adults. Okay. But that picture might change in future. We don't know. Doctor, here's the question that I want to ask because this is yes. something um, that I've been very... Um, when I was diagnosed, I'm I, I legit telling you, I was 24 when I was diagnosed. And for some strange reason, I was scared that, um, you know, because of diabetes and I had no clue type 2 or that type 1 or anything. I was misdiagnosed as a type 2. I think because some of that, you know, you're going to have a foot amputation. This is going to happen. That is going to happen. And uh, over time, I've realized that if it's unmanaged, yes, uh, you it could lead to serious complications. So, so what are your top or takeaways or giveaways to people to manage like foot care for foot care uh, who are living with type 1 diabetes. Yeah. So yes, I mean, uh, the complications uh, with respect to diabetes uh, that happen in the foot are mainly a result of the effect of uh, uncontrolled diabetes for several years, which happens mm -hmm. on uh, the blood vessels which are supplying uh, blood to the foot as well as the nerves. Yeah. So yeah. uh, when when nerves are damaged, the sensations are impaired, and that leads to uh, injuries and poor healing of injuries, etc. And in addition, poor blood supply. So uh, the the main thing is blood sugar control. So if we want to avoid complications in the foot, blood sugar control is the key. If we have mm -hmm. good blood sugar control, we can postpone these complications indefinitely. Uh, that is first thing. Second is obviously uh, being aware about how to take care of the feet. So, mm. I mean, generally, uh, as soon as, I mean, if your type 1 diabetes is of more than few years, couple of years of duration, you need to be very careful about how you take care of your feet. So this okay. includes, uh, this includes checking your feet every day uh, while taking, uh, I mean, washing uh, them clean. And the main areas which tend to get uh, forgotten are uh, between the toes. Okay. Between the toes. And uh, often people uh, take bath while they're standing, etc. So they may not exactly, I mean, they may not uh, uh, give as much attention to the feet as they give mm -hmm. their face or hairs or, uh, I mean, these things. So uh, I think careful washing and uh, adequate, uh, I mean, uh, instead of rubbing, mopping the feet is what would be required. We have to be careful while cutting the nails because if we leave the sharp edges, mm -hmm. uh, then uh, also that, that gives a scope for the sharp edge of the nail to uh, mm -hmm. cause injury. Uh, also, uh, the uh, next thing is the kind of footwear that you're wearing. If the footwear is very tight and if it is not taking care of the pressure points, it could cause cons and callosities and uh, other problems. So the footwear has to be, um, I mean, not kind of custom made, but it has to be comfortable and uh, soft. Mm. Bare feet walking is a big risk factor for pricks and injuries to the feet. So bare feet walking should be avoided. Uh, then the next uh, thing is uh, avoidance of smoking because uh, if you're smoking, that's an additional risk factor to damage your blood vessels. So avoiding smoking, um, 
periodically uh, examining the feet. I mean, beyond uh, 10 years of age, once in a year at least, when you go for visits, the doctor has to examine the feet properly, check the pulses, uh, check the uh, vibration sense, at least with the help of a tuning fork, and check some reflexes using uh, hammer, I mean, knee hammer. I mean, that's the examination too, basically. And there are also a few tests which, which can be uh, done if uh, they are clinically indicated. But clinical examination is very important. So annually, when, well, at least once in a year, uh, the doctor should check the foot uh, in detail. Okay. And so these tests you say should be only done if a doctor recommends them or, or these are tests that you should routinely go in for to get with your... Res with respect to foot, the main uh, thing is clinical examination. So a good okay. clinical examination is, uh, uh, I mean, is fairly good indicator of uh, how, the, how you are okay. doing. Uh, but yes, I mean, if medically advised, there are some tests like vibration perception or uh, ankle brachial index, or sometimes a nerve conduction velocity might be required. But I think this should be with the medical advice. Okay, great. Doctor, also, I noticed that the first thing you said, and I, I think that's so important, is that good blood sugar control is the yes. beginning and the most important thing in anything. Also, yes. uh, you know, taking that forward, what would your advice be to parents of uh, adolescent children who are probably diagnosed as pre-diabetic or diabetic type two? Yeah, uh, you uh, oh, you are talking of type two diabetes or pre-diabetes in mm -hmm. adolescents. Yes, doctor. Yeah. So now, uh, uh, now here you are dealing with two problems. One is diabetes, and other is adolescence. So uh, because uh, an adolescent is going through several uh, changes in physical appearance as well as appearance of the secondary sexual characteristics and also behavioral changes. I mean, they're seeking more independence. Uh, they, are, they are quite significantly influenced by their peers, what their friends and they want. I mean, their priority is not necessarily uh, health or that their priority is not necessarily diabetes control. So nagging them that you have to do this, you have to do that is not going to help. But what would help is uh, discussing uh, frankly, I mean, not keeping uh, the person in uh, in dark. I mean, if we discuss uh, with the adolescents, what is diabetes? What are the consequences? What are the sequelae? Why do we need to control despite of you apparently not feeling uh, any sickness or uh, anything wrong with you? Uh, I mean, these things need to be openly discussed with adolescents. And I find that most of our adolescents are very understanding, even though they may not show uh, initially that they are interested. But if you regularly reinforce your information, I think regular reinforcement of information is very, very important. And we should not be judgmental that, I mean, uh, often parents tend to get frustrated and give judgmental remarks mm -hmm. that uh, we are trying our best, but he or she is useless and she's not doing anything. I mean, these kind of remarks uh, work in a very negative manner. Um, also, uh, also a teamwork is important because uh, you know, uh, being type 1 diabetics, the amount of effort or work that is involved in day-to-day -day, uh, matters. And uh, I see uh, families leaving everything to the child, which is too much of a burden to handle. Um, I mean, somebody checking blood sugars, taking insulin, following diet, doing, I mean, this is too much of a burden to be handled by one person. So the parents have to share the load in a, in a kind of, a, you know, as a part of team, not that you are, it, it is some, uh, I mean, some, uh, somebody who need, who you need to control or somebody who you need, need to, yeah. kind of. so yeah. the parents need to work on their psychology because they should not take, um, any uh, deterioration of control or anything as their failure because often parents have that guilt that they are not doing a good job so uh, it's very important that the parents are also uh, i mean not seeing as a success or failure and very important for parents to also practice what they preach so if they expect the child to eat healthy and exercise they should yes. be doing that themselves uh, you know certainly certainly Certainly. I mean, there is no point. Uh, this particularly happens when there are big families or joint families that, uh, I mean, rest of the kids of the family or other elder members of the family are advising something but not implementing the same in their own lifestyle. And that makes a, a big impact. I mean, because, I mean, uh, those people then lose the ground to advise someone else, basically. Correct. So, um, 
and it it does work wonders if everybody in the family is doing the same thing and this should be done right from the time of diagnosis now since we were on the topic of type 2 diabetes it must be important to understand that type 2 diabetes mostly is not alone i mean type 2 diabetes comes with obesity high blood pressure cholesterol problems polycystic ovary syndrome uh, fatty liver so there are multiple uh, things so when we talk of treatment of type 2 diabetes we have to target the mother of these problems that is obesity so therefore uh, telling the child the importance and the negative impact of obesity is very very important uh, not just on diabetes but on every single organ of your body okay. so um, the key ultimately is self motivation yes thank you um i uh, have another question actually doctor uh, picking up on um, the fact that you think that families should uh, practice what they preach um the ch child or the adolescent uh, the other group or uh, set of people that they interact with equally is their peer support group or or their peer system in the school so uh, what is your advice or um, how do you think they should deal with this in their school setup um, because i often hear um, around that you know kids have issues with their um, fellow yeah. students yeah yeah so yes i mean yes uh, you chavi you have highlighted very important problem uh, because uh, children nearly spend one third of their uh, student life in school and it is very important for uh, to have adequate blood sugar control now what are the different kinds of barriers that i see in my practice uh, first okay. is uh, i mean uh, barriers which are related to kind of infrastructure where like people are not able to store insulin or they don't have a dedicated place or something a medical room kind of a thing or a person mm -hmm. to help uh, with mm -hmm. insulin doses particularly for small children now these are infrastructural problems which can be uh, tackled by adequate education and uh, making the school uh, make available these things now uh, hmm. the other set of problems is uh, psychosocial now it's very uh, the first thing is on the part of family or on the part of child um, uh, inability to be able to disclose the diagnosis in a confident manner even now uh people with type 1 diabetes and their families are very very scared to disclose that they have type 1 diabetes although this is this is nothing i mean this is none of their fault uh this should not be a problem at all but it does become a big problem this is because yeah. of several reasons one is uh, the repercussions that other children have or uh, the social kind of uh, repercussions that parents fear they might have but i think over a period of time all of us have to you kind of uh, i mean have this kind of a moment where people are not shy or afraid of revealing their type 1 diabetes the second mm -hmm. point is about bullying or teasing i mean it's very common for people uh, bullying is anyways quite common with respect to many many uh, things in schools particularly in adolescents uh, but with respect to type 1 diabetes they tend to be get they tend to get names like chini or i mean some some kind of names or and they they work in a very negative uh, manner on the psychology of the child i mean uh, children who are using insulin pump the other children would be curious to see what it is and they want to touch it or they want to sometimes pull it um these problems also happen i have had few scenarios where school teachers have uh, kind of uh, said that okay you are you are type 1 diabetic so you will not be able to do this or you will not be able to uh, do that so e even these kind of things have happened these work in a very negative kind of a manner uh, we've had uh, uh, children where school admission was refused because uh, because the child has type 1 diabetes now these are the these are very big problems and these are community level problems which need to be which need to be addressed and which need to be tackled uh i think that enabling the schools or educating the schools uh, staff mm -hmm. or um, school personnel and also the peers about diabetes is going to be helpful as a first step but this change mm -hmm. will take some time uh, to happen yeah. but I, i mean we see these changes happening in some of the metro cities 
uh, situation in uh, smaller towns or villages is uh, much more uh, worrisome. Hmm. And I, I remember, you know, when you mentioned, Doctor, about teachers mentioning that, you know, you can't do this because you're type 1 diabetic. Uh, yeah. It brought to memory uh, an incident which happened when I was in uh, class 3 or 4 and uh, we went for a camp and I was uh, newly diagnosed and I took a lot of effort of, you know, I, I threw a tantrum, I convinced my parents I'm going to take care and I got permission to go. Um, now the rest of the class was going in a cable car and my a uh, wonderful teacher, very well meaning, I love her deeply, but she mentioned to me that you cannot go in a cable car because you have diabetes. So, you know, I was uh, flummoxed. I said, you know, you call my mother, why don't you ask her? Uh, <laughs> that's true. I mean, that, that just shows a lack of, uh, you know, awareness. And uh, unfortunately, in, in the next 25 years as well, not much has changed. A lot of people still don't know um, that yeah. we can do everything. Certainly. I think also uh, there uh, also we must understand that uh, the teachers are responsible in that situation and therefore they might not be willing to take that additional risk uh, you know sometimes a rare event of uh, a low sugar or something happening i think that fear has to be removed from the school teachers and uh, school staff's mind yeah. and that will only happen once we educate them and once they are handling i mean once you I mean, if it is your first type 1 diabetes child you'll be very scared but if you have dealt with few uh, children with type 1 diabetes, then you kind of develop confidence. So uh, I, I'm sure that most teachers are well-meaning and most school staff is willing to help. It is probably they just need more ammunition uh, and education. That's true. So, uh, do you current or coronavirus pandemic that's uh, in, yeah. you know, existing right now? What is your advice for uh, diabetic children? Yeah. So, uh, uh, whatever little evidence we have till now, uh, fortunately, uh, there is no evidence to say that uh, children with type 1 diabetes, uh, particularly if they are well controlled, uh, have more chance of getting it or uh, more complications uh, from uh, the coronavirus. So, uh, so those who are under 25, uh, th those who do not have additional complications or comorbid conditions, and those who are reasonably well controlled, I would say, would have similar risks as a uh, general population. Uh, okay. The risks are more in older age or if you have associated high blood pressure or kidney complications or heart complications, etc. Um, uh, the risk of complications is then uh, slightly higher. I mean, higher. Uh, so what we have to do is, firstly, we have to do all the general precautions that everybody is doing. So we have to make maximum efforts to get prevented or to have a protection from coronavirus exposure. Uh, by regularly washing hands with proper technique and at least for 20 seconds using soap and water or sanitizer, not uh, touching you know eyes or nose and uh, mouth etc. And avoiding, uh, I mean, keeping a social distance. Social distancing is what I mean. These are the key things, and there are several other things which from time to time the government and everybody is giving advisory. Uh, they must be followed. Now the second important thing is the blood sugar control. So, um, although we say uh, that desirable control uh, levels etc., uh, are so-so, but you know that uh, most of the type 1 diabetes uh, patients are not achieving the targets any which ways. But I think that during this period, one has to be extremely careful to make sure that you are achieving the targets uh, of your glucose control and HbA1c in the desirable range. This will have to be done by taking insulin regularly uh, using, I mean, whichever method, if you're using multiple doses or insulin pump, that's fine. But taking insulin every time you eat and uh, adequate insulin. Secondly, checking your sugars. Now checking sugars of probably needs to be done more often than usual in this time. Mm -hmm. Remembering and revising sick day rules. So in case you get fever or any uh, illness, what are you supposed to do? That has to be revised and you should have a written, probably a written plan uh, of what you are going to do uh, if you become sick. Uh, I think you should ensure that you have adequate supplies of insulin, uh, hypoglycemia treatment, uh, glucagon injection. That is something which most uh, people with type 1 do not stock. But I would say that probably you should keep uh, one uh, dose of glucagon at least so that in case you have a severe low sugar, you can treat uh, that at home yourself or you are, I mean, you are, family member can treat if you are unconscious. Mm -hmm. 
uh, serum ketone meters also should be there. Uh, if not, at least urine ketone strips should be there so that you can check the uh, urine ketones. And you should have contact number of uh, your primary doctor as well as probably one more uh, contact number just in case uh, the doctor is not able to take your calls at that time. Okay. Uh, there are, I mean, uh, if you, uh, the pneumococcal or flu vaccine per se will not protect you against COVID infection. Uh, there is no vaccine against COVID infection, uh, but pneumococcal vaccine can protect against uh, secondary bacterial infections that could happen uh, when, if one gets a viral pneumonia. Uh, so, but again, now you have to weigh the pros and cons of visiting a hospital versus taking a vaccine. So uh, if your vaccination is not done, then you can just uh, contact your nearby clinician and uh, get your vaccination done. But that, remember that that's not going to protect you against coronavirus, but it can protect against some additional infections. And just for my knowledge, that's not a vaccine that's usually given uh, when you're when you're a baby, right? Like that, that's not part of the protocol. Uh, like when you're young, you give it. You're given the you know the BCG and uh, other uh, vaccines. So this yeah, is pneumococcal vaccine is not a part of national immunization schedule. Uh, but now uh, uh, the uh, several uh, private uh, institutes do offer it as a part of routine immunization for all children in the the IAP Indian Academy of Pediatrics schedule it is included uh, it is not a part of national uh, or a government schedule as such so everybody doesn't compulsorily get it it's one of the optional vaccines but most families nowadays do take pneumococcal vaccine uh, in the in, in infancy when the child is in infancy oh. at that time. Okay. But in case you haven't, then uh, I think this requires an individual discussion about who has taken, who has not taken, or how many doses have been taken. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Nubu, you want to go? Sure. Uh, yeah. uh, doctor, what is your advice to the uh, caregivers and the immediate family of uh, type 1 diabetic kids? Uh, in the context of COVID or in general? In general. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so mainly, I think that uh, what what is important is that uh, everybody works as a team, and um, it it is uh, it is the most important thing to be understood that the main person in the team is the person affected with type one diabetes itself. Often we forget uh, about that, even during consultations. Only the doctor and parents are discussing, but the child is sitting in a corner. I'm sure you, as a child, must have had uh, that experience that you are just sitting in the corner, not knowing what is happening in the consultation. So uh, the the child or adolescent has to be part of the uh, treatment. So uh, again, like what is important is the teamwork. So um, even in terms of family members, sometimes we do see that only one of the parent is doing most of the work and. Uh, because of logistic reasons, often fathers are uh, like outside the house most of the times, but still intermittently they can just kind of keep a uh, track of what is happening or communicate to the medical team about uh, blood sugar readings, etc. So I think that uh, the it is the responsibility of the parents to make sure that uh, the basic principles of management are being adhered to. Communication with the medical team is being done. And uh, discussion is being done with the adolescent about, uh, so what I would suggest is that uh, if once in a week, if the family sits down for maybe 10 minutes or 15 minutes and analyzes what happens in the, what happened in the past week, uh, so as to make plan for the next week. I mean, analysis should not be from the point of view of finding faults in someone. Like for example, sometimes the uh, father scolds the mother that you didn't do this, or I mean, <laughs> uh, then, uh, the poor mother, despite of doing so much of work, ultimately uh, gets uh, a so-called bad name. So uh, that that will cut down on her enthusiasm also. So it has to be a discussion uh, to jot down uh, two or three important things that they should do uh, in the next week, so that whatever they learned from the first week uh, is, I mean, uh, improved in the subsequent week. And if you're doing fine, then you should celebrate. I have a question about that, doctor. Even though I was diagnosed as an adult, but this is something that I always, always, when I meet a younger child, I realize 
um how important do you think it is for parents to give the child or as he keeps on growing he or she give them the autonomy to decide how they want to manage their diabetes because yeah. i feel like at the end of the day they need to learn um yeah. as as caregivers do you think at least in the indian set of parents are too on this thing i think parents are similar everywhere uh, but mm -hmm. yeah i mean we have our some cultural uh, uh, yeah. things which which are sometimes i mean which have advantages as well as disadvantages mm -hmm. uh but yes i mean what i would feel that anybody who is more than 8 or 9 year old uh is capable of injecting uh insulin mm. so uh they should be encouraged to take insulin themselves because mm. it is it is less less painful if you take insulin yourself if somebody else injects it is more painful i mean it's just like you pinching yourself versus somebody else pinching uh so uh, but uh in in that adolescent phase this administration is done by the child but should be supervised by the parent okay okay just to make sure that the correct dose is being taken because uh, there are uh, situations where adolescents or uh, very intelligent uh, children uh, may manipulate their uh, insulin doses to either get a low or you know uh, high sugar this may be sometimes a benign uh, reason like Uh, getting sweets when the sugar is low sometimes it could be a reflection of their anger or frustration mm -hmm. or uh, psychological uh, issues that they have so yeah. supervised administration is what i would uh, suggest but yes they should be encouraged to check their sugars take insulin be a part of uh, decisions that are being taken uh, and mm -hmm. yes uh, a step wise or stage or a planned autonomy Uh, needs to be given mm. uh, uh, yeah. another important thing is to give autonomy with respect to uh, career choices or uh, uh, i mean uh, educational or cultural kind of choices i mean uh, many a times uh, parents are very scared to send their children maybe abroad or um, uh, to let them uh, prepare for medical curriculum for example which according to some parents is very uh intense and uh, they they, mm -hmm. they wonder if the child will be able to tolerate that or not but i think these unnecessary restrictions should be probably curtailed or should be avoided I mean, we have to take some precautions but uh this is one big problem that we see sometimes the uh, uh, problem with respect to uh, you know i i mean as a lay person uh, and and a type 1 diabetic i noticed that uh, type 1 girls uh you know i mean as it is uh, you know women are the the second sex in the current scenario but uh, does it make uh, life a lot more complicated like you said in general you know career choices are difficult uh, and then add to it being a girl in this kind of um, culture or yeah. uh, i mean how how would you uh, advise parents to well uh, unfortunately yes i mean in today's uh, age also uh, whenever uh, a girl gets diagnosed with type 1 diabetes uh, after probably the initial thing the immediate question is about marriage so <laughs> uh, parents start worrying or wondering about marriage but i think that uh, i mean even this this problem we see even if the child is you know 7 year or 8 year old so i think that uh, we need to be reasonable and we need to be logical and it is not that child, i mean people with type 1 diabetes do not marry or they do not have children or there's nothing like that so um, i think this uh, this is one problem other thing is uh, particularly in uh, rural or uh, lower socio economic uh, strata uh, we even in today's date we see differential treatment uh given to a uh, girl child uh and not i mean not necessarily from fathers i mean sometimes it is even by mothers i mean uh, yeah. i i've seen i mean some families where fathers are quite caring but there is a conflict between the mother and the daughter for some reason so uh, uh yes some support is required i think uh peer support is what what is very important uh, for girls i mean there there uh, i mean this is like um, i've had discussion with my colleagues who have seen children or girls who are kind of driven to almost suicide getting full back to life just because they had uh, timely uh, peer support or psychological support 
and uh, i mean i think um, they need to see someone like chavi and nupur <laughs> to get motivation so i think it's very important to have in fact uh, some adequate support doctor the thing which really appeals to me is we me sit from when we sit down and discuss these things or uh, it was shocking because at this one time a uh, two year old child uh, from a her parents come and ask you know will she get married and then you realize that these fears are everywhere they're urban they're rural yeah. area with and these are part of the reasons which uh, you know kind of um, uh, brought about project gaia as well uh, you know so this is a yeah. initiative that we have started for uh, women and young girls with diabetes in india because i think our problems are really very unique and uh, even though diabetes might be the common denomin- denominator in um, you know in different countries as well but the problems that women face in india are uh, you know uh, specific to this region you know south asian uh, culture so yeah. hopefully we will be able to uh, make a difference as well well there are psychological different set of problems everywhere like western countries face problems of single parents or i mean uh, uh, conflicts in the families or i mean uh, uh, kind of the substance abuse etc i mean these things are like much less common in i mean although they are there i mean there it is not that they are not there but um, i think that there are some pros and cons of every particular every community no nobody is perfect but yes i mean uh, also i mean these concerns are to some extent there for boys also i mean uh, just like there are worries about marriage of a girl there are worries about boys uh, yeah. also uh, however yeah i mean totally with you in that girls uh, do particularly face additional problems um, just because of their uh, birth sex I mean. and you know we feel growing up uh, both my parents have been uh, extremely hands on i um uh, both my dad and mom to this date uh, you know they they ask about my sugars and they just they've been just very perfect and i uh, feel really lucky uh, but i realized while growing up that this is not the case elsewhere so i know you mentioned that you know the pressure of uh, taking care of a um, child with type 1 diabetes usually falls on to the mother and uh, and sure you know we understand because mostly fathers are the ones that are working outside but Uh, what advice would you give fathers because because it doesn't really justify the fact that they can completely stay away from you know uh, uh, raising a child with type 1 so and typically what typically what happens is uh, they are very uh, worried or very uh, concerned i'm i'm not making a generic comment about all fathers i mean i've seen fathers who are extremely uh, supportive and caring and in charge of the treatment in many families Uh, but yes i mean what happens in uh, some or more many families is that in the initial few days they are very uh, super active and they kind of uh, bombard you with hundreds of questions they search lot of literature but over a period of time they kind of uh, just withdraw themselves uh, in in some families and the burden of the care falls on the mother so what my advice would be is that uh, however busy you are uh probably you need to find maybe just two minutes every night to just uh ask how things are uh, mm-hmm. and probably intermittently they should appreciate the mother uh for doing uh, uh, uh just acknowledge and it is important to say that because uh, often we don't say things which we may mean also so it's important to acknowledge uh, that some effort is being done um, and as i said that uh, on the holiday or on a vacation just take out 10 15 minutes just to go through uh, the records just as you would do in academic progression you would intermittently see sit and see what is happening uh, and uh, making i mean what fathers can play important role is making sure that the lab tests are done from time to time visits are happening to doctor Uh, they can coordinate the appointments etc and any communication that needs to be done on email or uh, something like that being a part of that would be helpful to the mother also uh, what happens in joint families particularly is that the mother and the in-laws may be on a different page uh, so sometimes the mother 
tries to implement the advice given by the doctor but the uh, dadi or dada uh, of the family might say that okay chalo kabhi kabhi kya hota hai kya to and then the child senses this uh, difference very quickly and then the mother becomes kind of enemy <laughs> i mean uh, then they immediately seek refuge to wherever their goals are getting achieved so mm-hmm. i i think it is very important uh, for uh, the uh, grandmother or grandfather to reinforce the advice that is given by uh, mother and father and the father will have to work as a communication bridge between the wife and the uh, his parents uh so uh, i mean this is something uh, which uh, in my experience if one of the grandparent is having diabetes and is taking insulin then their understanding is much better as compared to uh, some other families that's great advice the team is the most important thing in the family right yeah, yeah. um okay um so we also have a couple of questions uh, from um, parents um, yeah. who yeah. want to know a couple of things from you yeah. Yeah. so this is from a parent in hyderabad um, his name is nareesh and um, he wants to know um for t1 kids um do they have issues with pituitary glands which um, is responsible for uh, the growth hormone deficiency and he has a 5 year old daughter who has uh, type 1 yeah. well uh, this association is not a very common uh, association um, okay. so type 1 diabetes and growth hormone deficiency although rarely it can be there but uh, this is not a very common association that we see in our practice Uh, most of the times uh, the growth problems in type 1 diabetes are either because of poor control of diabetes itself or because of some other common conditions like uh, hypothyroidism yeah. that the, uh, the uh, thyroid uh, hormone deficiency or uh, mm-hmm. in northern and central india's uh, celiac disease so these two conditions are much more common and they can be responsible for growth retardation if the ch- i mean if a type 1 diabetic is not growing rarely one could have growth hormone deficiency also but i mean that is not a common association um so you just said of uh, celiac is is something that specific to northern and central uh, india um, it is not specific it is more common in northern and central in india northern. but it is also oh. uh, seen so ideally uh, uh, this is only about celiac thyroid is yeah. uh, common everywhere um, hmm. so every child with type 1 diabetes need to be checked for hypothyroidism and uh, every child irrespective of where they belong to need to be checked for celiac disease at least at the beginning and hmm. in, in these parts where we are practicing we check it at least once in two years uh, on hmm. follow up also about celiac disease and thyroid is done once in a year uh, so uh, these are i mean these are more common causes of uh, growth failure so hypothyroidism celiac disease poorly controlled diabetes some psychosocial psychological problems where uh, severe i mean not not the i mean not just the stress no, normal stress etc but severe depression where child is restricting caloric intake etc that's okay. particularly common in adolescent girls okay not i mean but not particularly common but that is i mean common in adolescent girls doctor it's also uh, said that uh, autoimmune diseases usually come together so uh, yeah. the one of the most common things is also thyroid uh, amongst a lot of type 1s and uh, what would you recommend is the correct way to uh, there's a lot of confusion about is it just T- tsh or is it just uh, you know so so from a layman's perspective what should we test yeah so uh... and, and, and and if i could just add if you could just throw a little light on um, the difference between hypothyroidism and hyper um, because i think people tend to get confused between the two so basically uh, thyroid gland is here in our neck just before just yeah. below the uh, thyroid i mean this is our cartilage in the uh, neck it's a butterfly shaped gland uh, and it makes uh, very important hormones called as t4 and t3 uh, okay. and uh, it is controlled by uh, a small gland in the brain which is pituitary gland which makes tsh so okay. uh, tsh is the uh, controlling hormone or the boss basically and t4 and t3 are the kind of workers basically so what happens is that if the thyroid gland is uh, not functioning adequately which is 
quite commonly seen in type 1 diabetes about i would say 8 to 10 percent of cases of type 1 diabetes may have a thyroid problem uh, then the t4 and t3 will be low and the tsh will be high okay okay t4 will be low and tsh will be high now to make a diagnosis of hypothyroidism you need t4 and tsh these two tests are important okay uh, and sometimes in the beginning at the di- at the time of diagnosis we do a test called as thyroid antibodies tpo antibodies uh, that is done usually in the beginning just to check the propensity to get uh, get a thyroid problem those who have tpo positive would have to be more vigilant about checking their tsh in the subsequent okay. follow up tsh alone is uh, enough i mean in uh, in the subsequent once in a year we have to do tsh if it is coming normal and if it is obviously if it is abnormal then you will need treatment for uh, hypothyroidism which is basically replacement of a thyroid hormone in the form of a tablet uh, on the other hand hyperthyroidism is when the thyroid gland is making excessive amount of t4 and t3 okay okay even hyperthyroidism is most commonly an autoimmune disease and it can be seen in few uh, children with type 1 diabetes uh not as common as hypothyroidism but yes it can be uh it can be seen and typically it would manifest in the form of enlargement of the gland sometimes prominence of the eyes uh and uh symptoms which are because of excessive thyroid hormones which is which includes tremors or excessive heartbeat or uh, uh problems with the school performance or uh, inability to sleep in the night uh, or restlessness nervousness etc okay so, uh in it is i mean the, that requires a different uh, treatment uh whereas hypothyroidism re- requires replacement with thyroxine hormone okay that really simplifies it because uh, for me it even i have this confusion that chavi mentioned you know a lot of people get confused between the two and uh, this is a really easy way to remember that which yeah. is which yeah so in hyperthyroidism you would need to check t3 t4 and tsh uh, most of the times i mean we have to check all these uh, hormones but in most in most thyroid disorders subsequently at least uh, i mean t4 tsh uh, these two tests are good enough uh, antibodies we don't have to keep on doing it's not necessary okay. to keep on doing the antibody tests okay that was very very helpful doctor <laughs> sure so uh, doctor the next one uh, is also from another parent uh, the question is how often does the growth hormone affect the blood sugars uh, often there are unexplained highs and how do we kind of yes. get to the conclusion yeah so uh, i mean uh, we are talking of growth hormone that is produced inside our body or we are talking of growth hormone treatment because Uh, so i mean basically uh, uh, i mean uh, growth hormone has a, a action which is slightly opposite of insulin so uh, the main function of growth hormone is when we are fasting uh, there are a set of hormones which includes glucagon cortisol growth hormone and uh, catecholamines or adrenaline or noradrenaline these hormones make the glucose available uh, for use by the organs so this glucose is derived from either the glycogen in the liver or uh, the body makes glucose from uh, some amino acids and some uh, other substances basically so uh, growth hormone is one of the hormone which is responsible for making the glucose available when we are fasting when we are not uh, eating basically uh, so uh, it is kind of it, it is opposite of insulin but in the in routine uh day to day life we don't see much of the impact of growth hormone as such except during puberty so what happens in puberty mm-hmm. is that you are producing uh larger amounts of growth hormone and excessive amount of i mean uh, not ex- i mean uh, the we are producing sex steroids basically testosterone in boys and estrogen in girls because of this there is a increase in the level of insulin resistance in the body during puberty and that is the reason we see that when children are undergoing puberty the insulin dose requirement goes up okay. so the dose that we need of insulin is more uh, during puberty it can go as high as usually up to 1.2 to 1.5 unit per kg but sometimes it could go even uh, higher than that uh, 
Uh, another thing that we could see uh, because most of these hormones are produced in the morning, the sex steroids particularly. So there we could see a phenomenon of what is called as dawn phenomenon, where uh, the blood sugars become high uh, in the mo early morning hours, something like 5 a.m. to 8 a.m. etc. The blood sugars could go very high. Uh, so that is something called as dawn phenomenon, which which is more common in puberty. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yes, doctor. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, we have one more question relating to this only. Yeah. So, I, yeah. Okay. So, um, they say, is there any way we can say that the sugar variation is caused due to the growth hormones? <laughs> I think somebody is uh, using growth hormone and is not able to, uh, I mean, uh, find any other reason for the fluctuations in blood sugar. Um, with respect to a pubertal person getting high sugars in the morning because of dawn phenomenon, uh, yes. But other fluctuations, like if you're having fluctuating very, I mean, uh, low and very high sugars, uh, what we have to understand is that uh, whenever there are low or high sugars, common things come com happen commonly. So, uh, I mean, uh, most of the times these fluctuations are a result of imbalance between the insulin dose, food and exercise. I mean, that takes care of 80-90% of your uh, problems. So we have to really uh, ask if all these things uh, have been taken care of. If, I mean, am I Am I using the correct insulin? Am I giving it correctly? Am I injecting it in the correct site? I hope that I'm not injecting in hypertrophied or atrophied sites. Um, is my insulin and diet in proportion or am I taking more carbs than the insulin or less carbs than the insulin? Uh, and what about exercise? These three factors take care of most of the fluctuations. And there are some other things like associated conditions or sometimes behavioral problems. Uh, which are more common reasons for fluctuations than growth hormone deficiency or uh, growth hormone treatment. Okay, thank you for answering. I hope the parent got uh, their answers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I think um, we are pretty much. So, uh, actually, often we don't acknowledge. I mean, uh, there is a kind of uh, trusting relation between uh, the parent and the child. And therefore, uh, sometimes the parents uh, do not believe that the fluctuations are happening because the child is uh, manipulating uh, the insulin or diet. But it's very important to understand that uh, these kind of uh, behaviors are very, very common. Uh, eating disorders or manipulation of insulin doses are very, very common. Uh, and one needs to keep that thought in the mind always. We get sometimes children who are having lots of low sugars uh, with no obvious reason only uh, to understand after a few months that the child was uh, injecting insulin uh, without the knowledge of the parents so that's very common but the parents do not accept this thing right at the beginning but if we have the knowledge that these things do happen then without blaming the child we could uh, try and achieve a solution to these problems I think there's like a learning curve for parents as well because I remember this one case of a child that uh, was, uh, you know, he had some chocolate, a five star, and uh, he was so afraid that his mother would scold him that he took a big dose of insulin and then, you know, had to be rushed to the hospital. Yeah, yeah. severe hypo. So the way parents react to high and low sugars is also uh, important. Yes, it's a very important point. Okay. I still get scolded for getting a hypo, so I, I think it's not just it's not just about uh, kids, but even adults. Uh, like Nubu rightly said, uh, there has to be a learning curve for parents as well. So I think hypoglycemia is a part and parcel of treatment. Um, it, some episodes are bound to happen, but it is only that we have to uh, understand the pattern and we have to understand the reasons. And most episodes then can be prevented. I mean, yeah. use. Using a CGM would be an additional tool which could uh, also take care of, I mean, take care or rather diagnose hypoglycemia in a slightly better way. So I think we've exhausted our list of questions. Yeah. yeah. I, I think it's also uh, in the light of the COVID uh, pandemic, it's also important for people to revise uh, sick day rules. 
so um, yeah, yeah. i think uh, the uh, the sigde rules are a set of guy i mean things which we do when uh, somebody with diabetes or type 1 diabetes is sick uh, so in this the main and most important thing is not to skip insulin doses because reflexly you may think that the child is eating less you may tend to kind of reduce or skip doses but that that is something which can increase the risk of ketoacidosis this is because uh, in infection there is release of lot of stress hormones which increase the blood sugars so therefore you have to take your insulin doses regularly actually you may need extra insulin doses uh, and this extra insulin dose can be to the tune of uh, 10 to 20% or 5 to 20% of your total daily dose uh, this extra insulin needs to be taken in the form of short acting insulin like regular insulin or lispro or aspart or uh, epidra uh, that is blue lysine uh, the next important thing is to check sugars frequently so you need to check sugars frequently and you might need to take extra correction doses if your sugars are going very high uh, third is to check ketones so you have to check ketones using either a serum ketone meter or a urine uh, ketone strips uh, the next uh important thing is to maintain hydration so you have to uh, take non non sweet liquids like uh, water or salted lemon water or buttermilk or tea without sugar etc or coconut water uh but if your sugars are running low or on the lower side that can particularly happen if you are having diarrhea uh diarrhea illnesses basically so in that case you need to have some regular carbohydrates so if you are not uh, if your sugars are running low then something like one less than 120 or 140 if it is running like that then you might need sweet liquids to just to keep up the sugars to desirable range another thing that you might need is uh, glucagon uh, so if your sugars are tending to be low and they are not getting better despite of uh, taking adequate carbohydrates you might need a small dose of glucagon so these things should be there at your hand in spite of all this if you notice any symptoms like vomiting or abdominal pain Uh, or any uh, fast breathing or very severe lethargy etc or if your ketones are large positive then you need to contact the doctor so uh, i mean these are the set of things which one must remember uh, and revise before during this pandemic period okay that's actually a great uh, checklist for yeah. everybody yeah i i think it is it is always because uh, when there is a crisis in the panic situation one does not uh, um, uh, remember all these things unless you have had multiple times the drill of these things so yeah. and if 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 it is so, there in a written format with you then uh, hmm. you you don't have to really think at that point of time because your thinking freezes or if you are sick and <laughs> if you are not well very true so we have been in conversation with dr ganesh jawalikar doctor thank you so much once again thank for your time and wonderful advice it was really simple yeah. and uh, easy to understand for uh, lay people as well uh, thanks for taking out the time for being with us well thank, thank you, you for having me here and uh, it is i mean i have said this n number of times that uh, i'm i'm really impressed with your efforts and i uh, wish you all the best so that you spread the knowledge of type 1 uh, in our country because it is much much needed uh, thing thank you so much doctor thank you doctor thank you